Hello YouTube! I'm going to be doing something a little bit different in this video. Uh, this video is a response video to another YouTuber. Uh, I've never done one of these before, um, I'm just trying out something different, so let me know if you like this kind of content. So I'm responding to a video by Inspiring Philosophy called Moral Realism Defended. Uh, I will give the, the anti-realist response. Um, so first of all, uh, we need to specify exactly what moral realism is. Um, Inspiring Philosophy does have an earlier video in which they define moral realism, so uh, I know we're on the same page about this. Uh, a realist will say that moral judgments are beliefs, that some of these beliefs are true, and that what makes moral judgments true or false is independent of people's attitudes. Um, moral judgments are made true or false by objective stance independent moral properties um, and there, you know there's different ways of spelling out <laughs> exactly what these properties might be but i mean the, the general point of, of moral realism then is going to be that you know we might all be mistaken about what the moral facts are so uh, for example even if everybody thought that euthanasia was morally acceptable, even if everybody accepted values that were in line with euthanasia, um, it might still be the case that euthanasia is morally wrong, that euthanasia is made wrong by uh, objective moral properties. With, with that in mind then, let's uh, turn to uh, the defence of moral realism that Inspiring Philosophy gives. So Inspiring Philosophy gives uh, five arguments for moral realism. First of all, he gives a version of the argument from epistemic facts. The argument is as follows. Premise 1. If moral facts do not exist, then epistemic facts do not exist. Premise 2. Epistemic facts do exist. Conclusion 1. Moral facts do exist. Premise 3. If moral facts do exist, then moral realism is true. And the final conclusion is, moral realism is true. The problem that Cuneo identifies is how can a moral skeptic prescribe epistemic oughts while rejecting moral oughts. They are almost identical in how they operate. This can be explained by an example. If someone replies to this video with an argument for moral relativism, and I decide to reply, they will assume epistemic duties must be present in our debate. For instance, they will assume that I ought not misrepresent their argument and pretend to have refuted them. I cannot rely on logical fallacies, I should be honest in responding to what they say, and not lie. The moral skeptic assumes these things ought to be done in a philosophical debate. They prescribe epistemic duties such as these and believe they should be kept and abided by. But that is precisely the problem. Why should I if it is all relative? So, uh, f first of all, just um, I think it's worth clarifying. Uh, let's take uh, one of these epistemic duties, so something like you ought not to misrepresent your opponent's argument. Well, there's two ways we might interpret this, this claim. So, on the one hand, this could just be a straightforward moral claim, right? We, we might be saying that it's morally wrong to misrepresent uh, other people's arguments. Um, and obviously a moral anti-realist can make claims like that, um, but she's going to treat that as, you know, ultimately grounded in whatever her values are. Um, so, I mean, the fact that there are epistemic, that we, I mean, we might call that an epistemic ought in a sense, but obviously that's no different from any other moral claim. But there is another sense in which we might talk about epistemic oughts. So, um, regardless of whether it's morally right or wrong to misrepresent your opponent's argument, we might think that it's irrational, right? Um, so, I mean, in, in this sense, we're dealing with genuinely epistemic norms, right? The, the idea is that if you misrepresent somebody else's argument, you're failing to reason well, you're failing to reason properly. Um, I mean, imagine if you were the last living human uh, engaging with philosophy texts just because you find philosophy fun. Well, it wouldn't be morally wrong to uh, misrepresent your opponent's argument. At least it doesn't there doesn't seem to be any obvious uh, reason why it would be morally wrong, right? But um, it, it still seems wrong in some sense, right? So there still seems to be a failure of rationality. And there is a legitimate question to, to be asked of the moral anti-realist, um, which is, well, you know, if you're going to be denying that there are moral norms, how do we make sense of these epistemic norms? Um, 
Uh, now, uh, Inspiring Philosophy themselves actually suggest uh, the answer to this, I think. Some could object that we hold to these epistemic duties because they have pragmatic value in discussing what is true and reasonable, not because they are objectively binding. If you don't want to abide by them, it shows you don't value reason and truth. So we do it because it is pragmatic. Uh, why ought you represent your opponent's position correctly? Well, uh, there are uh, certain values that you, you probably hold, uh, the certain things you probably want. Uh, in particular, uh, you probably want to hold true beliefs and avoid false beliefs. And it turns out that there are particular ways of, uh, you know, approaching debates that will tend to um, maximize true beliefs and help you to avoid false beliefs. Uh, in particular, um, presenting other people's arguments correctly is a good way of forming true beliefs, or at least, you know, presumably, right? Um, if indeed that is a good way of forming true beliefs, then it makes sense that you would want to uh, present other people's arguments correctly, given that you want true beliefs. But um, Inspiring Philosophy doesn't think that this uh, really works, um, and their response is... But all I have to ask is why is it the case that we ought to be pragmatic? Why is the skeptic prescribing this duty? Is it honorable and right to try and be pragmatic in reasonable debates? Why should we value reason and truth? We are still assuming epistemic duties that are objectively binding. So I have to say, I find this response quite puzzling. Um, I don't think the skeptic, the, the moral skeptic, would need to prescribe the duty um, of pursuing reason and truth, right? Um, it's, it's enough that people just do uh, happen to, you know, value holding true beliefs. Um, like, so as long as we have the goal of acquiring true beliefs, then we can ask what the best method of acquiring true beliefs is. And, you know, then we can say, okay, given this goal of acquiring true beliefs, right, there are certain ways in which we ought to proceed. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no need to, uh, to, to, to like suppose that we have to be um, prescribing, right, certain fundamental goals, right? People just have whatever basic goals they do have. And, you know, that, that can be that can be that. Now, as it happens, I do think that um, we can give reasons uh, for pursuing truth. I mean, um, truth has some fairly obvious instrumental values, at least in particular contexts. Um, maybe not so much in the context of a debate about metaethics, but um, yeah, I mean, there are certain situations where it's it's valuable to know the truth because that helps you to achieve uh, certain other goals you have. But of course, that just pushes the problem back, right? You know, you can always just ask about whatever your fundamental values are. Well, you know, why that system, right? Why ought you to have those values? Um, but I'm not sure why a moral skeptic would need to give an answer to that, right? I think the moral skeptic will just say, well, you know, I mean, ultimately, you just have <laughs> whatever values you do. Okay, the second argument is uh, an argument from experience. You would be hard pressed to find someone who can actually live out moral subjectivism. If it is all subjective, then why should it matter how other people are treated if it doesn't affect you? Why do many moral subjectivists claim it is wrong to enslave women in some Middle Eastern countries when they are not in those countries or affected by them? Do not these other cultures have a right to make up what is moral for them? Yet, we don't live like slavery and the mutilation of women is okay, just because it is in a different culture. We actively condemn it. Well, I think the answer to this is pretty straightforward. Um, being an anti-realist doesn't entail being an egoist. You can still care about other people. You can care very strongly about them. Um, I can be moved emotionally by seeing uh, women under the Taliban be oppressed, right? Because maybe one of the things I care about is that other people have good lives, right? Like it, maybe it brings me happiness to see other people ha have good lives and it brings me sadness to see that they don't. Um, and, you know, there's some fairly straightforward explanations to be given about why humans have those kinds of emotional capacities. Obviously humans, you know, evolved as social animals, um, so that's going to influence the sort of emotional responses we have. People are brought up in society um, to, you know, value particular things. Um, but, you know, I mean, w whatever the ultimate explanation is, it can be the case, as an anti-realist, that you just value 
uh, the well-being of other people. If anything, um, I think that the moral objectivist uh, actually has some trouble explaining moral experience here. So suppose I were to uh, that I see somebody uh, torturing a child, right? And I, I immediately act to stop it happening. And then somebody asks me why I responded in this way. And I say, well, it was because I had, I, I recognized that I had an objective stance independent moral duty to do so. There would be something a bit weird about that response, right? Um, I mean, I, I suppose somebody could, you know, if, if, if you were to ask me why I did it and I responded, well, because that's wrong, um, it was wrong for them to do that, then that would make sense. But to, to say, you know, well, I responded that way, or I intervened and saved the, the child because I had an objective stance independent moral duty to do so, that seems a bit strange to me. Um, it seems like what's, what's motivating me there are, are the passions, right? the emotions, right? That, and those things are internal to me. It's not that I've recognized like some moral fact in the world. It's that I'm moved by my passions. That makes a lot more sense of moral experience, um, to me at least, than um, the kind of realist account does. Uh, the other point I, I would make is that um, even if you are an egoist, right, and you just don't ultimately care about other people for their own sake, uh, the way that other people are, 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 are treated can affect you. Um, so for purely self-interested reasons, I want to live in a society in which as many people as possible are happy, healthy, strong, free, etc. Um, the things that I enjoy in my own life are I think best achieved in, in that kind of world. Um, so, you know, it makes sense for me to resist those people who are trying to bring about a different kind of world. Um, and I, I suppose, of course, you know, you can say, well, you know, how women are treated in Afghanistan, that doesn't affect you. Um, but I mean, that's not entirely true. I mean, um, for one thing, I don't want those kinds of views to spread, right? So that's one reason to resist them. And for another thing, I think actually the world in general, right, and in, in my life, right, would be probably marginally at least better off if those women in Afghanistan were treated better, right? Some of the women who are currently enslaved by the Taliban might have been, you know, pursuing research in medicine or something that could make me better off. Um, so, you know, for these reasons, I think even if you are an egoist, it, it still makes sense um, to uh, uh, resist um, these, these kinds of views. Um, but as I say, right, a moral anti-realist doesn't have to be an egoist. Okay then, third argument, moral disagreement. Not only do we act as if moral realism is true, we also converse as if certain moral views are right, whereas others are wrong. If non-realism is true, then we have to accept the mutilation of little girls in some parts of Africa, or the values of the KKK, are equal to that of ours. In other words, we cannot disagree with them. We have no right to tell them they are wrong, or try to stop them, and therefore cannot argue our view of morality is superior. Now, I just want to say, well, equal in what sense exactly? Um, obviously, if you're an anti-realist, you're going to say that there is no objective, uh, stance-independent fact of the matter about uh, whose values are better. Um, but if you're an anti-realist, um, discovering the objective, stance-independent moral facts is not the point of morality anyway. Um, and certainly anti-realists can, you know, still engage in, in disagreement um, for all of the reasons that I noted in response to the previous argument. So I think the points made uh, in the previous response do go some way towards uh, dealing with this. Um, but there is still a, a further question here, which is just, well, like, how is it that anti-realists um, deal with disagreement, right? And why is it that disagreements um, seem to have this this kind of objective seeming character, right? Like we approach moral disagreements as if uh, one side was right and one side was wrong. Um, so I, I think that in practice, um, and from a purely anti-realist point of view, there are going to be many ways of approaching moral debates. So let's consider, for instance, a debate between a vegan and a meat eater, just for example. What might the vegan say to the meat eater? And let's assume that the vegan is, is an anti-realist, right? So what can an anti-realist vegan say to a meat eater? Well, first of all, they might appeal to empirical evidence. Um, so, I mean, this isn't so common these days, but there was a time when there was a sizable number of people who thought that animals 
were basically just automata, um, incapable of experiencing pain and emotions. You know, when, when, when an animal, you know, cries out when you stab it, that's just like, I don't know, it's like the hissing um, that a train makes or something when you, you know, put loads of coal in it or, or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's not actually experiencing anything. So on this point, the vegan might not even need to get into the question of moral values. They can just appeal to the empirical evidence concerning animal cognition. Um, they can try to show that the uh, em empirical beliefs that the meat eater is using to justify their position um, are, f are false. Uh, second, uh, they might appeal to shared values. So there are many meat eaters who, just like vegans, are opposed to bullfighting, opposed to fox hunting, uh, who favour animal welfare laws. Well, the vegan can then try to argue that the meat, in meat industry fails to meet the uh, standard of animal welfare that both of them are already committed to, right? Um, so like both of them already have this value of promoting animal welfare and the vegan can try to show that actually the meat industry um, is in conflict with that. Um, or there are many uh, meat eaters who care about environmental protection, right? And then the vegan can try to argue that the meat industry is environmentally damaging um, and so on. Uh, a third option uh, for the vegan is they might try to show that there is some inconsistency in the meat eaters uh, like general web of beliefs. So um, consider a person who says that no animals matter morally but that all humans do matter morally. We can then ask them well why right what is it that makes humans special and they might say that it's rationality okay so humans matter the reason why humans matter is because humans are rational. Um, but that seems to exclude a number of humans, right, including babies and the senile, right? Because there, there, are, there are lots of humans who aren't rational, at least they don't have the kind of rational capacities that, you know, normal adult humans do. Um, so if, if you're saying that, you know, all humans matter morally, but that the reason why something matters morally is um, because it has r certain rational capacities, but then you recognise that some humans don't have uh, these rational capacities, well, there's an inconsistency there, right? So these are some ways that we can we can proceed in moral disagree moral disagreements, and in none of these do we have to suppose that there are objective stance independent moral values. Um, moreover, I would suggest that this is how moral debates actually do proceed. Right. So when people argue about morality, they will either try to bring empirical evidence to bear on the topic, or they'll appeal, appeal to shared values. Values um, or shared intuitions or something like that, or they'll try to locate inconsistencies in their opponent's position, um, and that's th those are pretty much the the options that we have, regardless of whether you're a realist or anti-realist about morality. It looks like you're going to be approaching um, moral debates in basically the same kind of way. Um, so I think that that deals with the phenomenon of moral disagreement. Okay, then uh, the next argument is an appeal to moral progress and convergence. Moral progress can only make sense in terms of realism. The majority of people no longer think it is acceptable to enslave other races or murder people just because they are of a different tribe. If we consider this as progress, it would only make sense if we were slowly working towards an objective moral standard and not just arbitrarily changing morality. Well, the answer, of course, is that if that's how you're defining moral progress, then there is no moral progress. Um, there is perhaps moral convergence. Uh, it may, be, may well be the case that people tend to converge on certain beliefs over time, such as the belief that slavery is wrong. Um, but yeah, if, if you're assuming that progress involves working towards an objective moral standard, then convergence is not in itself progress. And um, an anti-realist is obviously committed to the view that there is no moral progress. So, I mean, this does leave a question open, though, which is, uh, OK, it seems like there has been some convergence in moral views. I mean, that's that's arguably true. Um, I'm actually a little bit sceptical of that, but I'm, you know, I'll grant it for the sake of argument. Right. So um, how does an anti-realist explain this? Right. If not by convergence on objective moral facts. Well, interestingly, inspiring philosophy himself suggests an alternative. 
because as Inspiring Philosophy sees it, there isn't actually that much disagreement on our fundamental moral values. Rather, um, much moral disagreement ultimately comes down to disagreement on empirical facts. So as Inspiring Philosophy says, Cultural differences on morality are not typically real moral differences, but factual differences. For example, these radical Islamic extremists do not believe women have souls, therefore it is okay to oppress them. They do not think slavery of what they call human is right. They merely have an underlying factual error in their thinking, which transfers to their moral ideas. Certain African tribes do not think it is actually good to murder infants, but think deformed infants are possessed by evil spirits or actually are evil spirits. They have factual errors, which cause them to act as they do. So humans tend to share the same moral values, but because people make factual errors, they end up uh, making different moral judgments in specific cases. But this provides, I think, a ready explanation for moral convergence um, that an anti-realist can appeal to. So humans tend to have, uh, for, for one reason or another, um, shared fundamental values. I mean, this is, this is uh, I think, quite understandable because, you know, we're all the same species uh, and there are certain ways of living that, you know, tend to promote survival and reproduction. Humans have always been highly social. Uh, we've always depended on others. Um, it's quite understandable that most people would want things like peace, security, prosperity, stability, etc. So it's not surprising um, that, you know, that there might be certain shared fundamental values. Now, these fundamental values will prescribe different kinds of behavior given different empirical beliefs, or uh, I, I would add, given different social conditions. But then as our empirical beliefs converge, right, through scientific investigation, right, we resolve empirical disputes. Um, as our social conditions converge, you know, through globalization, technological development, right, people in other countries see their standards of living and their ways of life, right, become more, uh, I guess, more like the sort of Western countries. As this happens, you would also expect uh, moral judgments to converge. Um, we don't need to suppose that there is, that, that we are, you know, discovering objective moral facts. Right. It's just that, right, we have these these shared values, right, perhaps as a result of shared evolutionary history or something like that. Right. And then with convergence on empirical beliefs, with uh, convergence in social conditions, that leads people to the same moral judgments. OK, then. Fifth and final argument is an appeal to moral intuition. Moral facts and duties are simply self-evident and intuitive. If we see a child getting tortured, none of us would think that is simply how other people see the world and we should move on. No, we all feel that must be stopped and justice should be done. But why? Because the idea of moral facts and duties are real and objective is self-evident and is our intuitive starting point. See, the burden is on the skeptic to show that our intuitions are wrong, not the moral realist. So even if I didn't have any other arguments for moral realism, this point on intuition would remain. It is the skeptic that bears the burden of proof in this instance to show us our intuitive starting point is wrong. We do not assume skepticism about our experience of the physical world unless we are given reason to. It is possible you are just a butterfly dreaming you are a human, but there is no good evidence to suggest it. So why accept a skeptical attack on intuition if there is no evidence to support it? Possibility is not probability. Likewise, we do not doubt our intuitive trust of our five senses unless we have a good reason to think that one of them has failed us. So why should we doubt our intuitive sense of moral facts unless we are given good reason by moral non-realists to do so? So in this case, the burden is on the skeptic who wants to argue moral realism is false. So first of all, I should say I'm, I'm not really that keen on burden of proof arguments. Um, I, I think there are contexts where it makes sense to say that a certain position bears the burden of proof. Um, but uh, this kind of debate, uh, in my opinion, isn't, isn't one of them. Um, I think that uh, when we're engaging in philosophical debates, the question should just be, you know, what are the reasons for or against um, particular views? Um, I, I, I don't really think it makes sense to 
uh, attribute the burden of proof to any particular view. Um, but I mean, look, if you want to play the burden of proof game, I mean, uh, well, I would point out that the moral realist has an inflationary ontology. And, um, you know, that tends to be a general uh, norm that we do not multiply entities without necessity. Um, so, you know, the realist is, is then going to bear the burden of proof in, in that context. I mean, we can explain um, moral intuitions, um, arguably, by appealing to our evolutionary history and our upbringing, right? There's no need, we don't need to postulate objective moral fact to account for our moral intuitions. So, uh, so yeah, it's the moral realist who has the burden of proof. Um, if I was inclined to engage in burden of proof style arguments, I might, I might say that. But um, uh, putting that aside, uh, there's this point about intuition, right? So um, the argument is that uh, our intuitions uh, seem to favour realism, right? Like we have, if I if I see a child being tortured, I have the intuition that this is wrong. Um, so I'll, I'll just grant for the sake of argument um, that intuition is reliable, right? Intuition tends to be truth tracking, right? In, in, intuition is a good guide to the way the world is. Uh, the problem here is I don't think that intuitions actually do support moral realism. So let's take this, this case of the child getting tortured, right? I see this and I think to myself, that's wrong or that ought not to be done, right? And this is a very strong reaction, right? So yes, I, I have the intuition that this is wrong, right? My, my like immediate uh, pre-reflective reaction is that that's wrong. But I don't think that says anything about moral realism. Um, so, I mean, for one thing, right, the vast majority of anti-realists still make moral judgments. Um, they just don't take those moral judgments to, you know, be reflecting some, you know, objective stance independent moral fact. So to support moral realism, right, the intuition would need to be at the very least something like, so instead of the, in the intuition would not have to be just, it's wrong to talk to children. Rather, the intuition would need to be, it is true that it is wrong to torture children. And in fact, even that wouldn't be enough because as we saw, uh, moral realism is the view that moral judgments are made true by objective moral properties. So, I mean, an anti-realist might hold that moral judgments are true, but that their truth is in some sense constructed by us. Um, the intuition that it is true that torturing children is wrong, that would not decide between uh, you know, these forms of anti-realism, right, these kind of constructivist forms of anti-realism and realism. So the intuition would need to be, um, it is true that torturing children is wrong in virtue of objective stance independent moral facts, or torturing children has the objective property of wrongness, or something like that, right? Like if, if that was your intuition, if you have the intuition that torturing children has the objective moral property of wrongness, well, okay, fine, then, you know, your intuitions support moral realism. But speaking for myself, I have no such intuition. In fact, my intuition is that that's completely ridiculous. Um, I have the, I have the strong intuition that it is not true that torturing children is wrong, that I have the strong intuition that torturing children does not have the objective moral property of wrongness, because moral realism seems crazy to me and it has always seemed crazy to me um so you know for any moral claim yes i have moral reactions but i certainly don't have uh the intuition that these reactions are you know reflecting objective moral facts um i mean no doubt that's one of the reasons why i'm an anti-realist uh, moral realism strikes me as totally counterintuitive moreover I don't think I'm all that unusual uh, in, in, in this respect. Uh, Anti-realism, um, I mean, certainly, so among professional philosophers, it's it's the minority position, but it's it's not like, you know, I mean, it's still a fairly common one, right? It's, it's a significant minority position, um, and, and, and not just among experts, but also among laypersons. I mean, um, philosophy lecturers often uh, complain about the uh, the sort of naive moral relativism that they encounter in undergraduate students who are taking moral philosophy courses. Um, so it seems like, you know, both among the experts and among uh, laypersons, there are many people who are, whose intuitions are actually more in line with, uh, with moral anti-realism. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, if it were the case that, uh, that like everybody had strongly realist intuitions, right, and we assume that intuition is truth tracking, then, you know, okay, that gives you some reason to believe moral realism. But um, I'm not convinced that people's intuitions actually are, uh, actually do sort of point in a realist direction. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I think that that deals with that one. One final point I, I would want to say here. So I, I've said that I've, you know, kind of granted for the sake of argument that like intuition is truth tracking, but I mean, actually I'm, I am very skeptical of, of intuition. Um, and I do think that there are certain relevant differences between say perception and intuition that, um, you know, can kind of, uh, ground, can make it reasonable to, you know, doubt intuition, um, or at least. Uh, intuitions in this kind of context, um, certainly like intuitions about the way the world is. So in the case of perception, um, one, uh, like I, I think important factor here is that we can sort of see uh, a kind of, we can see a connection between the source of knowledge and the things that we supposedly have knowledge of, right? So we can see a relevant connection between perception and objects in the world. Um, so just to, you know, kind of give a sketch of this, right, there's an object in the world, light interacts with the object, light travels to our eye, hits the retina, um, that causes stimulation of the retina, and that then transmits information to the brain. Okay, so that's just a very, <laughs> a very simple sketch, right? Modern science has filled in the details, um, but even before the development of science, right, people would have been able to give that kind of sketch, right? You, you would have been able to we can see how it's the case, right, that our perceptual capacities might be able to give us knowledge of the world because we can see how there's a connection between the two. But what's the connection between moral intuitions and these objective moral properties, right? How is it that uh, objective moral properties produce moral intuitions? That's far, that's a, that's a, that's a much more difficult question to answer. It's not at all obvious what to say about that. I mean, the things that people can say about it, but I'm just, you know, I mean, it seems like um, it's going to be a lot more difficult to answer that question. Um, indeed, in, an, uh, in a previous video, uh, Inspiring Philosophy did say that they conceive of um, objective moral properties as being like mathematical facts. So they're, be, they're abstract, right? Um, which means they uh, are non-spatio-temporal, they have no causal powers. So actually there is, uh, on, on that kind of view, um, then there's going, to, there cannot be a, uh, certainly no causal connection, at least between, you know, our brains and the moral facts. Um, but yeah, so the point of this is just, there may well be relevant epistemic differences between um, perception and moral intuition. Um, okay, well, uh, there you go. That's, that's my response to that video. That's all. Thanks for watching.